One, two, check. One, two. Testing one, two, testing one, two, three. Check one, two, three. Testing. Sound check. One, two, three. Sound check. One, two, three.
That's pretty much it. Two twenty-seven. Boy, they like that. People like to socialize and mingle, don't they? <laughs> That's good, though. Yeah, man. All right, we ready? We've got to get started. Let's do this. Got, got a lot of material here to get through. All right, here we go. 227. 227. 227. Here we go. Let's get this started. 227. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Say by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved. Are you? Amen. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father, join heir with a son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified Yes, saved by the blood of the crucified one. The Father he spake and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved. My sins are all gone. Yes, my guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved. Yes. All right, you can be seated. Amen. Are you? Amen. I'm glad there's a few folks in here. You can be seated. I'm glad there's a, there's a few folks in here that are excited, that are excited about their salvation. Amen. Yeah, amen. You should be more excited about what Jesus has done, what he's doing right now, and what he has prepared for you in the future, child of God, than anything in this world. Anything going on in this world, uh, no matter what, there's nothing, there's nothing better than being saved, amen. There's nothing that touches it. If you've not experienced that, you need to trust Jesus Christ and be saved and start living for Him. Amen. Amen. Day in, day out. And you'll find what you're looking for. Do you know that? Amen. This world can't offer you what Jesus can. All the money in the world cannot offer you what Jesus can. All the riches in the world cannot offer you what Jesus can. But yet, there might be someone in here that would rather have uh, money than Jesus. They'd rather have silver and gold. Isn't there a song about that? Yeah. I'd rather have Jesus than silver anything. I like that song. That's a good song. My sister, who lives in Scotland, my daughter lives in England, got people all over the world, uh, sent me a, a portion of the service yesterday, the coronation they had for the king and all that. Oh, I missed it. And <laughs> I, didn't, I, just wanted, I, I just wanted to watch a portion of it, but a very interesting 
Uh, during their ceremony, they had, I mean, they had, what do they call it? I mean, regalia or whatever. It's just, it was just full-blown, over the top. But in this large hall, they had an orchestra. They had singers singing, an orchestra playing. And then a man got up with a Bible. He actually just had a Gospel of Mark, a Gospel of Mark. He began to tell some things about the Bible. It was very interesting, and I don't know. No, no quite know what to think about it. I've Amen. texted my son-in-law, Callum, who obviously, he's from England, he knows that culture better, and he knows those people better. But my goodness, what he had to say about the Bible, it kind of excited me, got me excited, amen. <laughs> what a blessing. He showed, they showed up on a screen the two crowns that they use in the coronation and the scepter. And he totaled, he gave the total of, of the worth of the two crowns and the scepter. And it totaled 1.2 plus billion dollars, not million, billion dollars worth of jewels and gold. But during the coronation, uh, they, uh, I believe it was the king that has, the, the king would recite things from the part of the coronation. And part of that was, uh, part of that was, how did they say it? I'd like you to hear it was essentially saying that the Bible, the Bible is more valuable than all the, the crown jewels. Amen. The Bible is more valuable than all the crown jewels. And this guy, with thousands and thousands of people and everyone watching on TV, gave the gospel, <laughs> the free gift of eternal life. Praise the Lord. You can't earn it. I mean, it was like, wow. Uh, but I don't know what to think. You know, I'm always leery about, about those things. Uh, how does, how does, how, yeah, I know, how does the Lord look at those things, even if this guy, I pray that he's saved, amen, uh, how does the guy look, how does the Lord look at the messenger, because we know that the message is more important than the messenger, and God can use a lost man, and I pray he's saved, I pray he's saved, but the, what he said about the, the word of God in comparison to the <coughs> crown jewels worth over a billion dollars, and that Bible, and he encouraged the people to read it and get in the Bible, and it was something else. Uh, I'll say, if you want to, just a clip of that, and you need, it'd be a blessing to you to listen to that. You know, that's the birthplace of the King James Bible. Yeah, amen. And a good majority of those churches are now bars and everything else in Scotland, and they're in complete apostasy and darkness. And it's, it's, it's sad, but they're still, they're still a little light. Amen. There's always a little light. God always has a remnant. So we don't know what the Lord's going to do before he comes back. I know that the Lord's long-suffering. He's long-suffering. And maybe just before he returns, uh, he'll give some opportunities for a bunch of folks to get saved and, and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and get in right at the last second. I don't know. But we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Amen. Amen. Preach the word. Preach the word. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and come on up, brother, and get your Sunday school started. Uh, Thane, would you please pray? Okay. Dear Lord, I uh, do thank you so much. We got you to go out in that way. Dear Lord, that uh, no matter the motive, Lord, you will touch somebody's heart. Thank you, God, to be a part of this crowd of people that love your word and one of them, and for preserving it for us, for purifying it seven times. Amen. In our hands, and I pray God you strengthen our faith in it this morning, and we continue to science, technology. I think that even through those things, we can comfort someone that's hurting. together other people tired and given the right lesson given the right warning 
in there. Mm. There's an offering pl plate back on the windowsill back there for the Gropies if you want to be a blessing to them and give them an offering. We'll give that to them after the service. All right, come on up, brother. Right. There you go. It's already on. So. Okay. So that means they get to hear my own voice again. Huh? What? <laughs> Get on that. Okay. <clears throat> well, when when we dis decided that we would have those extra sessions yesterday that I, I hadn't I didn't know about until in, until we got here, I thought, oh, that's cool. That means I could do something else for Sunday school instead and do my do message on the eight men, you know, on yesterday, and so that worked out good. So I got a, I started praying about it. And, uh, well, Lord, what, I got an extra message. What, what should I do? And it's almost like a Ouija board. It, it just, my hand, my, the cursor went right down to this message. And the Lord said, this is a message that these guys will really get something out of. And so, okay, it's, it's again, it's not specific about creation and evolution. Um, hopefully, if we do the afternoon message, we'll get to one about that. Yeah. And we have, we've had a few, but uh, for some reason, this is the way to, I, I, I believe the Lord's directing is more, defense of the Bible Amen. and I know Amen. you guys you guys are Bible believers aren't you Amen. okay so uh, apparently the Lord wants to strengthen that a little bit or maybe Amen. maybe some of you are, are wavering I don't know but I mean uh, the Lord knows so this will be a little bit of a shorter message I, I, I think but uh, it's gonna have some important stuff and the message is called the book that rules the world and you're going to find out the Bible does rule the whole world. Hey. Now, in one sense, you look around and say, wow, it ain't doing a very good job. This world's a mess. But, but, it, but of course, the Bible predicted that would be because of our sin. Yeah. That, you know, the Bi the, that's one of the things that uh, it's hard to get through to a lost person. They look at this world and say, and they recognize there's all kind of problems. They, even, even a lot of uh, liberals and stuff look at the gender stuff going on, and they say, this something's way off about this yeah. <clears throat> but they think that's the way God made this world no God made this world right yeah. he made it perfect made he made it sinless man made it wrong man brought the curse of sin man brought all this stuff as a result of it and God says I'll fix it but now you got to go through you got to wallow in your mire for a while and then I'll fix it so anyway this the Bible whether people like it or not whether they believe it or not, whether they reject it or not, the Bible controls what goes on in this whole world. And we're going to see some examples here. Um, obviously, Israel is, is what God uses for prophecy and what God has always determined world events and international events is what goes on around Israel. Now, I'm, I'm not one that thinks that we ought to necessarily uh, just fork over money hand and fist to Israel. I think we ought to be a blessing to them, but I think sometimes we're counterproductive in the way, you know, our, our political actions. They are the world leaders in abortion and homosexuality. And I don't think that we need to be stealing taxpayers' money and giving it to them hand over fist so they can spend more money to kill their babies. Uh, so, I'm, you know, but, but I do think, obviously, the Bible says plenty of things about Israel, and God is not done with Israel yet. And... There, and, and he's going to bring the next thing God is going to do with Israel is what? Yes, try them, test them, judge them. All right. So if as a country, I mean, we're a country. We're not a church. As, as Amer America is not a church. It's a country. As a secular country, if we get in the way, the only thing that can happen is we're going to get right in the middle of God's judgment. So I think, you know, we try and tell Israel what, you know, we're, 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 we try to be Israel's sugar daddy. You do what we say, we'll give you a bunch of money. Instead of letting Israel do what they need to do, they're their own independent country, sovereign nation, make their own decisions. If, if they get bombed and they want to retaliate, well, I don't see a problem with that. If somebody bombs me, I'm going to retaliate too. All right, but they bomb Israel, and if they want to retaliate against people we don't want them to retaliate against, we get in the way and stop them from doing it. And that's not being a help to Israel. That's being a hindrance. That's being a sugar daddy. And, and we're going to be right in God's crosshairs when he comes to judge Israel. He's going to go through us first. I don't want to be part of that. I want to avoid the judgment. But nonetheless, 
I mean, you see a little sliver of Israel, the color in there, and all these Muslim Arab countries around them, and the people will complain that uh, the, the Jews are occupying Arab territory. Really? The Arabs got no place. The Palestinians have no place else to go. Where did they come from? <laughs> they got plenty of places to go. Their own people won't take them in, but they want to force Israel to take them. Well, okay. <laughs> If that makes sense to you, it doesn't make sense to me. But uh, past, present, and future around the world are determined by God, how God deals with Israel. And it'll affect the Middle East. It'll affect the rest of the world. The Middle East is the hub of the world. I mean, that's what branches out into Africa, Asia, Europe, and Europe branches out to America. So what happens in Israel blossoms out everywhere. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. He's gone and always will. It doesn't follow the Koran. It follows the Bible. Amen. Amen. Wait till you see what Israel eventually will get. Yeah. They'll get a lot, a lot of land. Some of the land they have now is because they were attacked by other countries. And so when they fought back, they kept, they kept the land they took. Okay, well, you don't like that? Don't attack them. <laughs> That's pretty simple. And then they complain, well, Israel ought to give all that back. What do you mean give it all back? It was taken from them in the first place. Uh, they're going to get some back, and they're going to have a lot more land than, than they do now. Um, and boy, if, 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 if people knew that, they'd be really ticked off, but too bad. <laughs> That's because they're, they're Antichrist. Now, one way that the Bible rules the whole world and controls the whole world, in Genesis 1 it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. So it's to divide day from night, a 24-hour day, 12-hour day, and 12-hour night. Let them be for signs and for seasons. See, the things in space, the lights of the firmament and all that, it's for, for day and night, for seasons, for days and years. We measure, our calendar is based on the sun and the moon and the stars and all that stuff up there. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. So we got the light in the daytime, the sun, the, the moon at night, and he made, the, he made the stars also. Kind of a ho-hum, you know, God made the star. He made the whole universe like it, it didn't even matter because that's, uh, that's God. <laughs> He's able to, to, I mean, the stars include novas and comets and all, all, everything else in space God just calls stars. We got the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the earth. And so everything else out there is a star. But to God, it's, so what? You know, I made the stars also. <laughs> it's an afterthought. So you see, our, our day, our year, our months, our, 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 our lunar divide, all, all our time divisions are based on things in the heavens, the celestial things. Except the week. Where does the week come from? There's nothing in heaven that takes a week. It doesn't take a week for the moon to do something or the sun to do something or a planet. Nothing. The only place we get week, a week, a seven-day week, is from the Bible, from the creation. Amen. A seven-day creation week, and God uses that as a comparison, uh, several things actually, but six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is, day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. So we have a week which corresponds with God's creation week just because that's how many days. God's number is seven, obviously, if you read through the Bible. Our no, we're humans. Our number is ten. We got ten fingers, so we use base ten. We multiply by tens. Our number system is by tens. God's is by sevens. And you can use any base system. You can, I mean, binary just uses zero and one. And at one, uh, you know, I, at one time I used to know binary pretty well, but it's years ago. But... <clears throat> but you can, you, you can use any base you want. We use base 10 because we have 10 fingers, so it's easy for us to count that way. But God uses seven because it took him seven days to do creation. And the whole world follows a cre the week. Why? I mean, atheist countries, communist countries, Muslim countries, you name it, we all follow a week. Why is that? You think most of those countries would, would follow anything but a, but a seven-day week because it comes only from the Bible. You can't find a, a seven-day week in, in the, the Book of Mormon or the Tripitakas or the Bhagavad Gita or the Koran or anything else. It's in the Bible. That's where it came from.
the only it's not in the heavens it's not in the earth it's it's in the word of god well a couple countries have tried different days greece tried a 10-day week of course you know after if you work every day after about five or six days you're done man you're shot and they realized this is not going to work they went back to a regular week Russia, I'm, I'm at, back in the day in the Soviet Union and all that, they were about as anti-God, anti-Bible as any country in the world. They decided they're going to try a five-day week because they knew the 10-day week didn't work in Greece. So we'll try a five-day week, work four days, get one day off. And after a while, they, that didn't work either. They went back to a regular seven-day week. So every country in the world, especially with international commerce, recognizes a seven-day week. And the only place they get it from is the Bible. The whole world follows the Bible, whether they want to or not, whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not, they're being controlled by the Bible. Amen. Then we have B.C. and A.D. That's kind of an obvious one. I mean, you can call it, they change, they change it now. They want it, instead of B.C. and A.D., they want to call it before common era. But it's the same year. What does that point back to? It points to Jesus Christ. All right, uh, the, you know, B.C. is before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So it's pointing to the, 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 the line of demarcation from B.C. to A.D., B.C.E. to A.D.E. or C.E., whatever they want to call it, points right to Jesus Christ. Every calendar around the world, the year points to Jesus Christ. Right. doesn't matter if they like it. doesn't matter if they know it. doesn't matter if they believe it. doesn't matter if they want it. It does. It's, it's, if you lay down on the, on the railroad tracks, the train is going to run you over, whether you believe it or whether you want it to or not, you're going to get run over. This is running them over. Uh, this, take a look at a few of these things. This is the Humanist and the New Humanist magazine. And they are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible. I mean, you look around at a few of the articles here. My best friends are atheists and different. Th so it's a, an anti-God anti-Christ, anti-Bible magazine. And you have the old version and the new version. But both of them, like I said, some of my best friends are atheists, uh, Young Atheist Handbook, uh, all that kind of stuff. But both of them, right on the front cover of every issue they ever put out, testifies of Jesus Christ. Every issue of the humanist and the new humanist has a testimony of Jesus Christ right on the cover. Hmm. American Atheist Magazine. I mean, obviously, keep the merry, dump the myth. They're not on our side. They, they, they would rather celebrate Santa Claus than Jesus Christ. And it's, uh, once again, 2013, they put a t testimony to Jesus Christ right on the cover of every issue of American Atheist. Amen. American Atheist has no choice but to give testimony of Jesus Christ Amen. on their cover. Skeptic Magazine, did Jesus exist, and was Jesus married, and all this wild stuff. I mean, they, are, they, are, they, they name themselves skeptics, okay? They are skeptics. They're not skeptical of, of, of some things. They're not skeptical of the date, 2012, and whatever the date, I can't read it from here. But again, both magazines giving testimony straight pointing to Jesus Christ. Skeptic Magazine. So much for being skeptics, they're testifying to Jesus Christ right, up, right on the front cover. Evolution Magazine. Evolution from the late 1800s or early 1900s and then Evolve, a more modern magazine. Now obviously, I mean, we're, that's what we're here for. We're dealing with evolution and creation. And we got Evolution Magazines and the same thing. December 1927 and uh, I can't read that from here. Summer of 2000 and something. Again, testifying of Jesus Christ right on the front cover of every issue of the old Evolution magazine and the new Evolve magazine. And they're giving honor to Jesus Christ <laughs> without even knowing it or caring. Or, but there it is right on the cover. Darwin Day. Uh, this is an interesting thing to me. Here's Darwin Day. Uh, there, it's a, a nationwide movement that was begun by a, a man named uh, uh, Zimmerman. Uh, Dean, uh, or, or, uh, Dean, Dean, yeah, Zimmerman. Um, I, I knew the guy. Actually, he, he used to be the dean at our local university in, in Oshkosh. Then he moved uh, to Indiana, to Butler University. Then he's moved somewhere else. I'm not sure. But, but uh, he wrote a book called Science, Non-Science, and Nonsense. 
And it just got published at the time that we were going to have Kent Hovind in at our church. And so I said, here's a great opportunity for you to publicize your brand new book. You can have you, I mean, you, you can debate Kent Hovind on creation and evolution because his book, Science, Non-Science, and Nonsense, was uh, defending uh, evolution and defending global warming and all that kind of wild stuff. And so I thought, here's a guy that probably will benefit from having a debate against Kent Hovind. And you think he'd love it. He's trying to publish a book. He's just issued it. And he, he would not receive uh, a mail from me. He re, I, I sent him certified mail, signature required. He, he wouldn't, re, wouldn't accept it. The ra local radio station called him. He, he, he wouldn't go on the radio. The local newspaper called him. He wouldn't uh, do anything in the newspaper. So everybody tried to get the, when they realized that we had Kent Hovind coming in and going to look in the debate of a, a, a evolutionist, well, here's the perfect guy. He just wrote a book on it. He, he'd make money off of the thing. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't he do it? But he wouldn't. So finally at the end, after he, he ducked everybody else, I challenged him to a debate publicly in our, in our newspaper, and he would not respond. Here's me. I'm a factory worker. I've been working in a factory all my life. And he's afraid of me? He's the dean of science at the university. And he's afraid of me? He's a published author. And he's, afra he, he's afraid of me? Anyway, he started Darwin Day. And he also started a thing called the Clergy Letter Project, where he wants to get churches involved in promoting evolution. And the theistic evolution idea that, oh yeah, maybe he doesn't believe in God, but he knows enough people do, that he wants to uh, have churches promote theistic evolution. Like, yeah, there's a God, but he used evolution to get, to get us here. Which, as pastors mentioned three or four times, just doesn't work. Uh, it's worse than oil. It's total, they, they contradict each other. There's no way. But you can see again, uh, my, my buddy uh, Dean Zimmerman, uh, he's got the date right on. Every single year they put this out, they've been doing it for 20 years, 30 years now. <laughs> There's the date, 2013. The guy trying to refute evolu or creation, trying to refute the Bible, gives homage to Jesus Christ right on the cover of his poster that he's promoting his event. Amen. He can't, can't avoid it, can't get around it. That's the power. Do you believe the Bible has power? Yes. You believe the, the Word of God has power? It says it does. So ap apparently it does. It influences what these guys do. Communist International, Chinese Times, Communist Nations. Saint, I mean, Moscow down here, Petrograd, you know, Russian stuff. That's all, all communist stuff. Ancient stuff and more modern stuff. And uh, of course... All of them have the date right on the front page, right on the cover. They can't get away from it. The Bible rules the world. Whether they like it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they want it to or not, there it is. You've seen it over and over and over again. Um, we'll go by, skip this. There's a thing called the uh, red record. Um, and what it does, well, I, I, this page... This page ought to have been first, I think. But uh, there's a, a group of Indians. They're called uh, the Delaware Indians at one point, the Lenny, Lenape at another point. They're one of the few Indian groups that have written records. Most, a lot of Indian groups did not have written records. They are also the oldest known Indian tribe. There might have been some before that we don't know about, but they're the oldest ones we know about, and they had written records. And their written records, and that was what all, that other, all this other stuff was about, matches the account of Genesis, in order. I mean, it's almost like they're, they're, it's a different version of the Bible, but it mentions all the same stuff. <laughs> and that's the Indian records from, you know, back in the early days of the Indians and the early Americans. And it follows the same creation order, you know, Adam and Eve and the evil snake and the great flood and, and then the ice age after that, and it just matches the Bible. Now, there's a lot of uh, controversy about it because obviously the evolutionists and, and skeptics don't want that to be true. So they say, oh, it was, uh, it was actually uh, written, you know, hundreds of years after those Indians and, you know, somebody forged it. I, I, I don't know if you can prove it either way, but uh, you can look it up and make up your own mind. Now we have biblical accounts that are corroborated by cultures all the way, all around the world. Yeah. And some some pretty interesting things that you, you would wonder, why would some little story that happened in the Middle East be spread all the way around the world where people on, in every continent have their own version of that same story? 
It's just kind of unique. It's like the, like the Bible controls the world. <laughs> so starting to believe that after a while. Most cultures have a creation account. We could understand that. Any culture is going to say, have an idea, how did we get here? And until the modern days when they have gone uh, totally against God and they make up these theories like evolution, they would have their God created the universe. Okay, I, I, you would expect that. That's no big surprise that you would find creation accounts all over the world kind of matching the Bible account because they're, both, they're all describing God created the, the universe. Okay, that makes sense. And, and if, we, if we tried to put that on a map, we'd color the whole map in whatever color we use so you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to recognize anything. But you know, several hundred, at least 300 known cultures around the world have flood stories that match Noah's flood in a lot, a lot of uh, incident, a lot of great to a great degree. Not always, they don't all match every, every item, but a lot of them do, and it's all around the world. North America, South America, Australia, Africa, you name it, there are accounts. Why would an account of a flood be all over the world unless a flood happened all over the world? Now, what they will say is, well, it was just spread by word of mouth. The people in the Middle East had a local flood, and it flooded their area, and uh, they told it to the next tribe, and the next tribe, and the next tribe, and it's over, you know, a couple thousand years, it spread to where everybody's got, got an account of the flood. And they, they have a little bit of details. One guy built a square boat, one guy built a bigger boat, one guy found a, the tallest mountain that didn't get covered, or, or weird, some things, but, but uh, uh, you know, it started uh, as, as the Bible account and spread out by word of mouth. That is hard to believe, but probably in a court of law, you couldn't prove it wrong. You'd have to say, well, I guess it's possible. Not likely, but it could happen. But, we, so if, we, but if we wanted to put, uh, use a symbol to uh, recognize all the cultures in the world that have flood stories, we'd have to have 300 arcs covering the whole map. There would be no room on the map for anything else. So I'll just use creation for that, the flood, the flood there. And uh, yeah, we would just ask that. Why would so many cultures have stories of a flood if it didn't actually occur all the way around the world? There are accounts of a tower to heaven. Why would cultures all around the world have, have stories about a, people building a tower to heaven and then the language is getting mixed up after that? Wow, all over the world they have these accounts. Uh, Tower to Heaven leading to the multiplication of languages can be found in at least nine cultures scattered on every inhabited continent. There they are. You got them in Australia, you got them in Asia, you got them in Europe, Africa, North America, South America. All over the world they have accounts that match the Tower of Babel. That's a strange, why, why would that story be spread all over the world? Un, 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 yeah, <laughs> un, un, unless it had some kind of, unless it really happened. They wouldn't invent the same story by chance. People in, in, in uh, uh, northern Canada and, and South America and India would not invent the same story just by luck. Oh, we just happened to invent a story about the tall, a, tall, a tall tower that they're trying to build to heaven and God mixed up their languages. Why would everybody invent the same story by coincidence? That's harder to believe than evolution, I think. So I, I think that's because the story took place. It really happened. Amen. Now, we talked a little bit about Joshua's long day. Here's uh, some interesting uh, things about it. There are at least 18 chronicles of an event matching the account of Joshua's long day all around the world. And this is where it gets really interesting because only five of them are actually of a long day. Now, if they spread word by word of mouth, like they claim for Noah's flood and like they try and claim for the Tower of Babel, if they spread the story of Joshua's long day by word of mouth, the story that would spread around the world would be a long day. That's duh, you know, kind of obvious. But only five of the accounts are a long day, and they're all in the Middle East area, which is where it, where it happened and where they had a long day. A bunch more, it, you know, again, if the story was spread by word of mouth, it would be expected that cultures would all have long day stories. They, they don't. Ten of them have long night accounts. 
Is that interesting? Only five have the long day account, but ten on the other side of the world have long day accounts where, or long night accounts where they would have experienced a long night while this side experienced the long day. So they're not parroting the story that they heard from the Middle East. They're telling what they observed, what happened to them, and that matches what should have happened to them based on the Bible account in the Middle East. So they would have a long, a long day on this side and a long night on that side. And there are, there are more accounts of the long night than there are of the long day. Then we have at least three uh, in the Fijis, in the Hawaii, and in uh, southern uh, Alaska, three accounts right on the edge where it would be sunset. We've got three sunset stories that they had a long sunset. The sun hovered for hours uh, and it didn't go down. Uh, one had the sun uh, just went down and came right back up. Uh, but they, they have, we have three accounts of a long sunset right where the sunset would have been to match up with the long days on one side, the long nights on the other side. It's almost like maybe it really happened. And they're reporting on what they observed and what really happened. It's, uh, we mentioned uh, yesterday, and, and I forget who I was talking to, but, but uh, when the similar thing happened in uh, was it Hezekiah's sundial, uh, the sundial went backwards, uh, you know, and, and, and he got a letter from Babylon asking him about it. I mean, it's mentioned in the Bible, the, the king, kings, king of Babylon asked him about the wonder that was done in those days. So it wasn't some parlor trick that the king did with his uh, sundial in the backyard. It was something that they observed, I don't know, a thousand miles away in Babylon. And they said, what in the world? Did, that, did you see that? It happened to us. And they wrote, they wrote to the, you know, back, back to the king and, you know, what happened to you guys? We had this weird thing happen. So it's not, they weren't making up a story. They were telling what they observed, what really happened. Yeah, 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 they, know, they knew where the world center was, <laughs> where God operates from. <coughs> so again, these things indicate they were not just repeating a story. The event actually happened, just like the Bible said. The Bible Amen. rules the world, day and night and sunset. And so here's just kind of a panorama of all, all the stuff together, all the different things in the Bible that are vindicated around the world through through stories that had no connection. I mean, people in the Fiji Islands have no connection with the Middle East. They've probably never been there, don't know anything, but they have the same stories because God's Word controls the world, went around the world. So the book that rules the world is, is our Bible, and it does rule the world. It controls the world uh, whether they want to. It controls communists. It controls skeptics. It controls Muslims. It controls everybody. Whether they like it or not, they got to recognize their book doesn't control me. So there's something, something about that Bible. My Bible controls them, but the Koran, I don't even consider it. You know, I, don't, I don't wake up and check what the Koran says and make, you know, run my day by it. But their day is run by the Bible whether they check it or not. They don't have a choice. So, yeah. so that will be the end of this. And uh, probably we're done early. I haven't checked, my, checked the clock, but this was a quicker message, so perfect for Sunday school. And uh, again, Lord, we thank you for the things that we're able to, to look at and learn and pray that you would use them, bless them, and apply them as each person that, that sees these things as they need, Lord. And we, we thank you for the opportunity and ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, flip over to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. I had a couple thoughts. Got a little, got a few minutes. Yeah, no, you can, you can preach a Sunday school message. We have. Uh, <laughs> Psalm 19. Now, where's the verse, uh, the worlds were framed by the word of God? Is that in James, Hebrews? Hebrews? Hebrews. Thank you, Joe. My walking, my walking Bible there. Hebrews chapter 1. The worlds were framed, framed, framed by the word of God. Do you believe that? Yeah. Uh, part of... The framework of society is days, weeks, months, and years. That's part of our framework all over the world, just like the, just like the brother gave you. 
Part of the framework of our society and world has to do with days and weeks and months and years. That's part of the framework. And we all, the whole world, lives within that framework. I mean, don't you think it's at least a little bit profound that the whole world fo follows a seven-day week? I mean, stop and let that settle in and think about that a little bit. Why haven't they changed? Like you said, they tried changing it and they went right back. Seven days, Genesis chapter 1. It's almost as if the Bible's true, amen? amen? It's almost as if, like you said, brother, the whole world is framed, the whole world is controlled by the Word of God, and there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. You can try to tear down the framework. Anytime you try to tear down perfect framework, you think you're going to construct something better? And that's what man's attempting to do. Tear down God's framework and constructing something that's going to somehow work and progress and come out better on the other end. The framework's already set, and it's framed by the Word of God. In Psalm chapter 19, I pray you're familiar with this chapter. What does it say? In verse 1, the heavens declare the glory, the glory of God. You know the Bible declares the glory of God? Amen. Genesis chapter 1 declares the glory of God. You know, when he spoke the worlds into existence, he, he made something out of nothing. Let science try that one. That's actually against science, is it not? Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. The only possible way to create something from nothing, there has to be an outside source. There has to be a God. There must be a God. This didn't happen by chance. That this, all this didn't come by nothing. This seven-day week just didn't pop up and say, you know what, the whole world is just going to follow a seven-day week. Let's just do this. <laughs> if, if everything started out of confusion and everything started out of chaos and everything started out of an explosion, wouldn't you think you'd, some cultures would have a 10-day week, a 24-day week? A... But like you said, that's interesting, brother. Nothing in the, nothing in the universe or the solar system uh, dictates that we have to have a seven-day week. Am I right? Nothing out there dictates that we have to have a seven-day week. Now, a 24-hour day, it dictates that. But a seven-day week, only the Bible. How do you explain that? How would an atheist explain that? Well, they can't. <laughs> they all got together, yeah. Even though we're all speaking different languages, all have different cultures, all have different customs, but yet... The one custom that's universal is a seven-day week. There's a lot you can learn from Genesis chapter 1. You know, even an atheist, if they just begin right there and say, you know what, that could be true. And then start searching for the truth and desiring the truth. Just Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. Just one verse. Universe. Amen. Why would they call the universe the universe? You want, me, you want me to tell you why? Because the Bible rules the world. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, 1, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handy work. That's his handy work. Did you know you're his handy work? You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God made you to glorify him. Like the, like the heavens... De like the heavens declare His glory, He made you to glorify Him. He made you to praise Him. And if you don't, guess what? The stars will. The stars do. The moon does. The sun does. Hey, the rocks will even cry out. Won't they? Won't the trees clap their hands? Won't the trees clap their hands when Jesus comes back? Most of the world, when, when Christ returns to this earth at the second advent, when He steps foot on the, ground, on, on the earth, most of the world will not be clapping their hands. <laughs> yeah. There'll be a small remnant that are looking for him to return. Look at verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech. Day unto day. Yeah, this 24-hour day, this seven-day week, this 31, 30-day month, uh, uh, day per month year, or, and then 365 days, 360 each one of those days utter a speech. It says something. You know what it says? God set this thing up. That's what it says. God set this thing up. 
Day into day out of the speech, night into night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language which their voice, where their voice is not heard. Their line has, go out th has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Those things are speaking. Every day is speaking. This seven day week is speaking. It speaks, it says something. And it says there's a God and that God gave you a book. You know what he gave you? He gave you a perfect book. Whether you believe it or not, he gave you a perfect book. Uh, if you were here on Wednesday, I mentioned how the Bible says that the, words of, uh, the word of God is forever settled in heaven. Question, does God have a perfect book in heaven? Or the errors in his Bible? You know, the, you, know, it, it, you know that you're going to be judged. You'll be judged out of the word of God. The books will be opened. So it's an open book test. Correct? Yeah. So what you're trying to tell me, if you don't believe there's a perfect Bible on earth, you're trying to tell me that God's keeping something from you, that he's going to judge you with. So God's going to judge you with a perfect book, but yet he didn't give you that perfect book. That doesn't seem like a just God. Wouldn't a just God give you the same book that he has that he's going to judge you out of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Or you think God's sitting in heaven and saying, oh, I got something they don't. Nah, 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 I got a perfect Bible, but you don't. No, God gave you a perfect Bible, and he gave it to you in English. Say, why English? <laughs> What's the universal language of the end times? It's not Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's English. Are they learning English in China? Are they learning English in India? Are they learning English all over the world? I wonder why. <laughs> God gave you a perfect book in the English language, the King James Bible. Does God have a perfect book? Yep. You mean he didn't give you one? <laughs> Even though Jesus said man shall live by bread alone, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, but, but God didn't give you every word? Some of you that know my testimony, when I got a hold of the King James Bible, that's when, that's when my Christianity changed. That's when I finally began to grow spiritually. Amen. Because I had a foundation. I finally had a foundation to build upon. I was no longer tossed to and fro. God gave you a perfect book. There's not one error in that Bible. And that's why all the other Bibles compare themselves to this. I will be like the most high. Yeah. Romans chapter 1, you know what it says about man? They're without excuse. They're without excuse. Now, how does that stand up if God didn't give, you, give man a perfect Bible? Wouldn't, couldn't you judge God, say, God, you've got a perfect book, but you didn't give me a perfect book? How are you going to judge me out of something that you didn't give me, that I didn't have access to? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He's a righteous God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I got a perfect book. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. Give me another Bible that's produced more fruit. Come on, give it to me. Give me another Bible in any language that's produced more fruit than the King James Bible. Give it to me. Stand up, tell me. Since 1881, how's, how's the church looking? Since they've started producing new Bibles, how's the church looking now? How many wars? How much bloodshed? How much apostasy? And now you have so much confusion surrounding Christianity, you don't know what these people believe. You go by their church and see a name on their church, I have no idea what they believe. It's just mass confusion. But you know, the King James Bible believers were the ones that are trying to cause division. When we're trying to get everyone back to... I thought one was the number of unity. Oh. So maybe the multiple versions, that's what's caused the division. Yeah, God's not the author of confusion. I got a perfect Bible, I don't know about you. <laughs> Amen. And if God wants to prove me wrong at the judgment, then you should have never believed you had a perfect Bible. <laughs> you should have believed you had errors in the Bible. You think God's going to say that? And then judge me, and then judge me out of a perfect book that he didn't give me. What kind of a just God would do that? You'll know them by their fruits. The Reformation. You know those six Bibles before the King James Bible? The King James Bible is the seventh English Bible, purified seven times. 
That's the seventh one, and they settled on that one. Where the word of the, where, where the word of a king is, there's power. And from 1611 to 1881, do you have any idea how many missionaries were sent out with that book all over the world? Millions of souls saved. Dwight L. Moody, Billy Sunday, you name it, go right down the line. King James Bible. I always like Billy Sunday. He said, I'd rather learn my ABCs in heaven than my Greek and Hebrew in hell. <laughs> I don't need a Greek and Hebrew to understand the English Bible. Uh, biblical Greek, the biblical Greek, Koine Greek, is dead. It's a dead language. All that does is cause confusion. Amen. Amen. Uh, man's without excuse. All that you got to do is look up. Those things on those magazines, I'll explain that. It's dated back to the birth of Jesus Christ can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. You're, you will not prove that Bible wrong. As young people now, they're trying to prove the Bible wrong. I'll prove that the Bible, it ain't going to happen. Shake their fist at God. I'm going to prove that that Bible's not true. You know what you're going to end up proving? That the Bible is true. Amen. I tried it. Have you ever tried it? Just shook your fist at God, shake your fist at the Word of God, just begin to rebel and see how your life turns out. And I'm, I'm glad I'm on the winning side. All right, let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll get started here in just a bit.
that I print out. Oh, that you print out? Yeah. All right. Amen. It's good to learn. Oh, good. All right, here we go. Grab a songbook. Grab a songbook. Let's get started. 406. 406. 406. Yep, we prayed on Wednesday for her. 406. Are we ready? Here we go. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helper? One twenty seven.
Amen. All right, you can be seated. Sister Gropey, would you like to come up and sing?
remind the church one more, one more time we have an offering plate back there. Testing, testing, here I am, I can hear it, so I hope you can. Now, something I really hate is when some young punk corrects my message and fi or, or adds to it. I was preaching in, in, in Michigan years ago, it had to be almost 30 years ago now, and uh, I mentioned the uh, streets of gold, and this 14-year-old kid, David <laughs> Moses, comes up and says, it's only the street of gold. <laughs> Go sit down, little boy. Who do you think you are to correct me? And, no, actually, we, you know, I, I appreciate when, when somebody corrects me or somebody finds something that I, that I missed. And we just had that happen today. Now, I, he wouldn't have been a young punk to me back then, but he is today because now I'm older. But he just mentioned, he says, you know, another thing that we don't have any scientific reason or celestial reason is how many hours are in a day. I thought... Good point. Now I got to change my whole message. Thanks. <laughs> but when you think, I mean, in the Bible, it said, Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Why would we pick 12? Humans wouldn't. Humans would pick 10 or a multiple of 10. We, we, we might have 10, 10 days ten hours of daylight and 10, 10 hours of, of night. We wouldn't pick 12. Yeah. Why did we pick 12? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 12 is the number of Israel. It's not the number of the Gentiles. Uh, Again, God rules the world. Amen. Amen. And I'm not, not really mad at the young punk for adding that to me because I'll be, I'll be glad to add it to my message. That'll, that'll flesh it out a little bit better. What we're going to look at this morning, and he probably don't feel like a young punk, but he, you know, when, you're, when you're my age, everybody's a young punk now. <laughs> Inside, I'm still like 16, but outside, I'm over 60, and it, the, the, body, the body doesn't want to do what... What's on, what the inside wants to do. But this message is, some of you may be familiar with uh, Pastor Harley Keck in Wisconsin because yeah. he's the guy that, that uh, I pre, uh, he's had me to his church a couple times. They're an hour away or so. And uh, well, he's retired now and his associate took over, uh, but still a good friend. I preached it, this message at his church and a girl from his church and when I got to the end and started going through the Bible verses and your accountability before God and everybody will face God, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, when the service got over, she made a beeline to the pastor's wife and said, I need to get saved. Amen. This message. Amen. Uh, and what had happened, her, her whole family were Christians. She was the black sheep of the family and rebelling against it. Her father had been called to preach and resisted the call because he knew he had a, a wayward daughter who wasn't living right, who, who didn't profess to be saved, and so on and so on. So actually, he, he got mad at his old preacher because it, he preached a message on people faking it, being a Christian. And he thought, well, you're, you're picking on my daughter. So they got mad and left the church and joined uh, Pastor Keck's church. Um, but in the end, now this girl comes forward and gets saved. He waited a little while to watch her and observe her, and you know, six months went by. She's still coming to church faithfully. She's still serving the Lord. She's getting involved in ministries. Amen. Everything's been going good and, and has ever since. So he went to Pastor Keck and told him the story. You know, I probably don't even belong at this church. I should have stayed where I was. I got mad at the pastor about something stupid. And, uh, you know, he was just preaching a message that you preach to anybody, people faking being a Christian. And I took it personally and thought he was picking on my, my, my daughter. You know, and because it was obvious to me uh, that we were in that situation, but he, he probably didn't single her out. It just, that's, that's a common message to preach on. And he says, you know, and, and the Lord's been calling me to preach, and uh, now maybe I can because now my family's in order, my house is in order, my, my, you know, I don't have rebellious kids anymore. And uh, Pastor Keck said he was never so happy to lose a family. Because now they went back to the church, reconciled with their old pastor, reconciled with Pastor Keck. The girl rec reconciled, obviously, with her family. And that was six, seven years ago. Uh, now he is pastoring a church in northern Wisconsin Amen. that's running 30 to 40 every Sunday. That happened because his daughter got saved at one of my meetings and this message. So um, Pastor Keck has promoted me a few times in uh, fellowship meeting and stuff saying, hey, this guy came to my church and this girl got saved and now we got a church going, running, you know, you know, hour north and 
Uh, so he's uh, done his best to try and get me other meetings in the past. Um, so he's, he's a good friend, good guy. We've been over these verses over and over and over. And, uh, you know, this message is usually, it's my Sunday morning message because it's a good combination of, of Bible and fossils and artifacts. <coughs> and so I usually do it first. And here we're near the end, and now we're just getting to, you know, we're doing the first, we did things backwards, but that's just how it worked. We had the, the weekend worked out that way. But, you know, we've seen without faith, it's impossible to please him. You can't please God without faith somewhere in the, in, in the equation. But he gives us so many things to, to strengthen our faith, to, have, to prove and to show that it's worth putting our faith in God and in his word. I mean, the Koran doesn't have any reason that we should put, it, put our faith in that. The, the Mary Baker's Keys and the, uh, the Book of Mormon, uh, there's no reason to put your faith in, in stupid not. things like that. There is good reason to put your faith in the Word of God. And that's why we, we don't just put our faith in the Word of God because we're blind and ignorant and stupid. Yes. And God doesn't want that kind of faith. God wants a reasoned faith. He wants us reason together, prove all things, try the spirits. God, God wants us to put his word to the test because it will pass. Yes. And the other books, religious books, you know, the Bible's not a religious book. It's 80% history, yeah. but it's, it's God's word. Yeah. It's, it's not a religious book like the Koran or the Bhagavad Gita or any of these other nonsense books that are religious. It's, it's a book of truth, a book of fact, a book that can be confirmed historically, uh, prophetically, archaeologically, scientifically. Uh, you can't do that with all these other religious books. And the heavens declare the glory of God. We've heard that several times, just heard that. Uh, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we need to uh, be Bible apologeticists. Uh, give, that's what, where the term apologetics comes from, to give a reasoned answer from that verse. And so that's what we need to, God wants, God gives us reasoned answers. He doesn't have us have blind faith. He gives us, we got reasons to put our faith in the Bible. Now, Christian kids, man, they got, a, they got a, Christian kids, and kids from a Christian family, let's say, they've got it, they got it pretty rough. Uh, everywhere else they go, the Bible is condemned and refuted and preached okay. against and uh, you know everywhere they, it used to now when, when i when we were kids some of us older folks you know not you young punks but uh, us older folks when we were kids almost everybody in america would profess that the bible is the word of god sure. even lost people i mean catholics and mormons and jehovah's witnesses and and just run-of-the-mill citizens and they got some bible somewhere just growing up in america either in school or in a paper on tv and magazine somewhere not today Today, they don't even get the Bible in church in a lot of churches. Yeah. They sure don't get it on TV and in the public schools and on the Internet. And everywhere else they go, they get, they get the Bible trampled on. And I, I give the illustration a lot that uh, a few years ago, we were visiting my brother who lives in Michigan and, and his family. They've got eight kids, and my mom lives with them now. And he had, he had maybe about half of his kids at that time, and we decided hey, let's take the kids to the Detroit Zoo. And Detroit Zoo, when we were kids, we went there several times. It was one of the best zoos in the world. It had all I went there because I wanted to see the animals. Isn't that why you go to a zoo? I wanted to see the elephants and the tigers and the polar bears and the gorillas. and all, I wanted to see. Well, so we thought, hey, let's take the kids and go to the zoo. We haven't been there in, in years since we were kids. So we went to the zoo, took his kids, and every exhibit, just about every single exhi exhibit, either had something promoting evolution or something promoted uh, the environmental nonsense and global warming and save Mother Earth and, and all that. Every exhibit. I just want, I, if I wanted to get, get corrupted by liberal propaganda, I could have stayed home and watched CNN. I didn't need to go to the zoo and have them try and cram that stuff down my throat. I went to the zoo to see the elephants, but they wouldn't let me. They wanted to give me all this propaganda. And, but that's what our kids are dealing with. So an hour a week in Sunday school does not counter what they get six or seven hours a day in the public schools and however many hours a day on the internet. And then when they go to the museums and the zoos and read magazines and hear it on the radio, they, they're not getting it. So 
an hour a week is, is, is kind of rough to, uh, to combat that. There are now six different studies that have shown why young people drop out of church, drop out of being Christians or living a Christian life, and just become secular altogether. And they, they do this, 70% is pretty much a, a, a good average here. Seven out of every 10 young people in, a church, in Bible believing churches drop out of church before they get to college age, by the time they graduate high school. So the colleges aren't even what's doing the damage. The damage is done before they get to college. And the reason is because they do not look at the Bible as a relevant book of truth. They look at it as another religious book, like the Quran or something else. And they don't have a foundation for what they believe. So even if they, believe, even if they get saved and really get saved, they don't have a foundation for what they're believing, and they're going to be fighting with themselves because they still might believe in evolution. They still might believe in, in a lot of the other philosophies that the world is, is putting out there. And you know, an hour or so uh, in church a week just doesn't begin to combat what they're getting 40 hours a week every place else. Yep. And so you know, they, don't, they don't know that there is a basis to believe the Bible scientifically, factually, historically, archaeologically, prophetically. Now once they get that, and that's what this, this kind of ministry is endeavoring to do, once they get that foundation, the, the percentage is about flip-flop. 70% of the young people in church stay in church their whole lives and raise their kids in church. Well, that's a big difference. So I want to, I want to be involved in something that can make a difference like that. Uh, so that's encouraging to me. There, uh, the Barna Group did a survey of millennials. And millennials are the people right now, probably like, like this young punk that was challenging me. <laughs> they are the, the parents raising the kids of today. So you can imagine what the next generation is going to be that much lower than, than these statistics. Like I said, when I was, when I was young, except for maybe a, a handful of people in academia and some militant atheists, 95% of the people that you talked about would at least say something nice about the Bible. They wouldn't, they wouldn't degrade it. They wouldn't spit on it. They wouldn't cuss it out. They, not today. Uh, the the uh, millennials, only 24% of millennials believe the Bible is Scripture less than a quarter. When it was almost 95% or somewhere around there when I was a kid, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't caveman days. 30% <laughs> do, will do profess that the Bible is a good moral book, except it's not if what they believe is true because the Bible claims to be the Word of God, claims to be infallible, claims to be perfect, claims to be you know, straight from God. So if it's not, then it's lying. Yeah. So it's not moral. <laughs> so for them to believe it's moral, they are contradicting their, themselves, and they don't even realize it. Right. They're calling an immoral book, according to what they believe, a good source of morality. So yeah, that's the, the battle that goes on in their mind. And let, until they get this stuff straight, until they decide, I'm going to believe the Bible and trust the Bible and learn the Bible and understand it, until they get to that point, they're going to be fighting with themselves. They're going to have like the devil on the shoulder and the angel on the shoulder, except inside their head. Uh, and, and they're just going to, even if they're saved, they're, they're going to be battling themselves for the rest of their lives. 19% of, the, of those surveyed said the Bible is irrelevant and should just be ignored. Okay. 27% say the Bible is dangerous and should be eradicated from society. That's more than, the, than who believe it's, how they believe it's Scripture. They want to get rid of the Bible because it's dangerous. I'll tell you something, they're right. It's dangerous. If you reject it, it's dangerous. So the Bible is a dangerous book. Jesus saith unto him, and this is where we get the title from. The, the title of this message is, uh, Jesus saith, I am the truth. And we're going to look at the things that Jesus professed to believe. And if Jesus believed them, and you claim to be a Christian following Jesus, it only makes sense that you would believe the same thing Jesus believed. If not, what are you saying about Jesus? Yeah. That he was wrong? That he was mistaken? That he was ignorant? That he lied? I mean, there are no good alternatives. Either you believe Jesus, or you're saying something pretty bad about Jesus. I don't know of an in-between, but 
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And this thing truncated some of the fonts again, so I hope I can remember the rest of the verses. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. Yes. So he's, he, he is the truth. His record is true. In John 18, he says, Jesus answered, To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. So his, he came to bear witness unto the truth. His record is true. He is the truth. And of course, John 17, 17, speaking about the word of God, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we see truth, 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 all through these verses. Apparently, God puts a premium on truth. Yes, he does. All right, so I, I would say then what, what, what Jesus said and what Jesus believed is true. Yes. Let's take a look at it and check the evidence and check him out. God says, be, don't be afraid to check me out. Let's, let's go. Let's do it. Jesus believed in the creation, Adam and Eve, the global flood, Jonah and the whale, Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you believe these things? Amen. Yes, sir. I, I, Jesus did. Do you believe on Jesus? Do you believe Jesus was the Son of God? Amen. Uh, if you do, you probably need to believe these things too. Amen. There is, evolution has been taught throughout history, different facets of it. Now, not everybody taught everything that's taught in the universities today, but some came pretty close. Um, we've got uh, Anaximander who taught humans evolved from fish, and these are mostly from the, the Greek Empire uh, teaching this stuff. Uh, Plato taught that the universe came about hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, Empedocles taught spontaneous generation, recombination evolution, and natural selection. And these were all, you know, two, three, four, five, six hundred BC, the, the Greek Empire. Epicurus taught that the universe came from chance movement of atoms. Uh, we got uh, Democritus. I think they founded a political party too, but he talked about uh, primitive people spoke unintelligible sounds until they evolved language. Okay, I think uh, the, some, uh, <laughs> they do speak unintelligible sounds until they evolve language. The Mayans believed in a common ancestor evolution. They taught that. And at, at this time, this is stuff that the Apostle Paul would have been very familiar with. He was, you know, the Hebrew of the Hebrew, and uh, Hebrews, and uh, probably a member of the Sanhedrin, or at least as, as uppity as, as they were. And he, I mean, he knew the stuff. He had, he was educated uh, in, in, uh, by the Jews under Roman do occupation, the, mo the most advanced country in the world. So he probably had the best education available to anybody in the world. He knew all this stuff. He rejected it. Not because he's an idiot, but because he's not an idiot. He looked at this stuff and said, that's nonsense. It, it, it's no. And, it, and, and he preached creation all the time. The ancient Hindus, 1750 B.C., almost 4,000 years ago, they believed the universe began from a seed. In the universities today, they call that the singularity. And that it expanded 4.3 billion years ago. Today they say the Earth and the solar system is about 4.6 billion years old. The number is even fairly close. And that has, it has expanded and contracted several times over, over the years, over history. And that's called the multiverse theory, uh, the Big Bang, Big Crunch theory. That's the state of the art of evolution that they teach in the universities today. Or, well, Friday, because they're off on Sunday. But although... You know, yeah, I, I missed the king being cor coronated yesterday. I didn't see a minute. I didn't even know about it till I looked this morning. It's, oh, I missed it. You know, I, I'm going to get to see a different king coronated, Amen. so I, I, won't miss, I won't miss a thing. Uh, also, uh, sometime today, uh, Alice Cooper is putting on a concert here in town. And I'm, I grew up a half mile away from Alice Cooper. I mean, he, he lived right, right where I grew up. And, you know, um, and I, th I, I believe he's a Christian. I've wa heard enough of his testimony, not that I supported him some of the stuff he does in the rock industry he probably should have got out of that altogether but that does uh, we're all sinners uh, he just has a more uh, obvious notable sin but uh, anyway so you could have went and saw alice cooper today <laughs> or you could have been here and, and seen this stuff and uh i don't know i think he made the right choice and, and uh, 
So, I mean, the ancient Hindus taught almost what's taught in the universities today almost 4,000 years ago. Now, that would have been stuff Moses was familiar with. Moses grew up in Egypt or on, under the Egypt as, a, uh, as the prince. He literally had, I mean, he was, it's the world power of the day, most advanced country of the day, and he was raised in the king's palace. He had literally the best education in the world. And when he saw all this stuff, he op opened his book and wrote down, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That? that this stuff is nonsense. We're going we're gonna to give the credit to God. So it wasn't because Jesus, Paul, and Moses were ignorant and stupid and didn't understand evolution. They didn't know the science that, that, that we know today. They knew it all. And they rejected it because it was nonsense. Amen. So Jesus saith, I am the truth. Okay. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Jesus believed in Noah. Jesus believed in the ark. And the flood came. Jesus believed in the flood and destroyed them all. All. He believed in a worldwide global flood. And how about this? Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He's comparing it to his revelation. Is Jesus saying, you know, uh, th this stuff about Noah and the ark and the flood is a, a bunch of myths and nonsense and fairy tales, and that's what I'm all about? Yeah. That'd be kind of stupid. All right. So he b actually believed in the flood. And it kind of looks... Like maybe this world was flooded. I mean, look at I mean the world's almost flooded today. And if you flip around the other side, it's 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 even more a higher. The Earth is over seventy percent covered with water. It's not hard at all to believe in a worldwide flood. They believe in a worldwide flood or a global flood or what are you going to call it on Mars, where they've never found a drop of water. They found features that were probably, could have been laid down by water, canals and salt deposits and different things. And, and maybe they were. The Bible talks about water above the heavens and water. Every, so it's, we could find water anywhere in the universe, and it's not a problem with the Bible. So there could, they, there could have been water on Mars, but we don't have any evidence of it. Or we don't have any proof. We, we, we've got a couple of suggestions that it looks like maybe water was on Mars at one time, but it doesn't even doesn't even mean it was flooded totally, but their scientists say Mars once had a flood of, quote, biblical proportions. Yeah. Well, biblical proportions is a global flood. They can't believe in it. They, they can believe in a global flood on Mars where there's not a drop of water that they know about for sure, but they can't believe in one on Earth that's 70% flooded now? There's, there's a reason for that, and it's in the heart. It's not science. The science is not why they don't believe in a global flood. The science sure looks like I, I, I can't, can't hardly not believe it. Uh, if, if you, in fact, because the mountain ranges are mostly on the coastlines, if you leveled out the land on, on the continents around the world, the whole world would be a half mile deep underwater today. The only thing that keeps that is the mountain ranges and it keeps uh, the, the coastlines a little uh, above sea level to keep the water out there. Otherwise, we'd be flooded today. There's enough water to flood the water. So, well, Jesus saith, I am the truth. And he believed in the flood and he believed in Noah and he believed in the ark and he believed it was worldwide. And apparently the evidence suggests it's true. So, uh, yeah, why is it so hard for people to believe in a global flood? I mean, I took that off of my computer on, on Google Earth showing you how much water is, is in, on this Earth. It's, it's almost flooded now. We've got clamshells, and I have one over there, of a, a closed clamshell that was found in the Himalaya Mountains, yep. tallest mountain range in the world. Now, you tell me, how does a clam get to the top of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world? Did, did it hitchhike? He don't have a thumb, so he can't hitchhike. Did he, ta did he, did he take a helicopter, uh, a taxi, a, a Uber? Well, they didn't have Uber back then. So uh, uh, how, did, how did the top half mile of Mount Everest, half mile, pretty significant amount, 
is comprised 100% of fossilized sea life. How in the world is sea life on the tallest mountain in the world? And that's what it's made out of. Well, you know, evolutionists say millions and millions and millions of years that mountain moved and, and, and somehow some kind of nonsense. It's a lot easier to believe that the world was one time underwater. Amen. And see, so all the sea life would have been the things that went down. And the mountains and valleys and the terrain of this world was created largely or reshaped by the flood. Yeah. Um, the mountains are probably much bigger now than they used to be before the flood. Uh, you might have bigger depths and taller heights. Uh, and so every, all the sea creatures that died fell down to the ocean floor. And then the results of the, of the flood and the, the abating of the flood would push the mountains up with all that sea life on top of it. That's a whole lot easier to believe than the nonsense of millions of years, the rock moved a little bit at a time, and, and, it, and it bent just a little bit. If you want to believe that, help yourself, but I'd rather believe Mother Goose rhymes. They make more sense. Um, and the clams are closed. Clam, if you go, go to the beach, you see lots of half shells because when a, when, the, when a clam dies, its muscles obviously die and relax, and it opens up. But these are all closed. That means they were killed and preserved rapidly. Yes. Fossils do not happen if you leave something out for millions of years. Fossils happen in the right situation, the right conditions. They can happen rapidly, they can happen within days or weeks. And there are places in the world now that they know how to make fossils. And they will put stuff like a, like a tie uh, in where, where the water is coming down in this, this waterfall uh, or a teddy bear. I actually had a teddy bear for a while that was fossilized. It was put there for like a month and fossilized because of the conditions and the chemicals that were there at the time. And my, my creationist friend Ian Juby, uh, he has the teddy bear and he, he let me borrow it for a few months when, so he could go back and forth without having to pay uh, duty and stuff on all his materials. So I had his whole collection for a couple months. And uh, that was kind of neat because it was even more than I got. He's got things I don't have. Um, the Krukowski quarry is about an hour away from us. They found, uh, it's just several years ago now, they found thousands of fossilized jellyfish. How, jellyfish are made of goo. <laughs> How do they fossilize if you leave them laying out for millions of years? The sun's gonna bake them, the, the, uh, the rain's gonna wash them away, uh, the, wind, the wind's gonna blow them away, animals will scavenge them, insects will scavenge more, microbes will scavenge whatever's left over, and in, in no time there will be nothing left of a jellyfish, nothing. They're not going to turn into a fossil over millions of years if you leave them out. But yet we have thousands of jellyfish fossils just an hour away from where I live. Again, that tells you something happened rapidly. Yeah. They, were, they were killed and preserved too, so fast that they couldn't decay. And so it didn't take millions of years. It's just the opposite. Fossils prove the Bible is accurate. Fossils uh, are evidence of the flood, not evidence of millions of years of evolution. This on the bottom is an ichthyosaur that was in the middle of giving birth. And the whole fossil, it had just given birth to one baby. It's got one baby uh, on the way out and one more inside. So uh, giving birth to three babies. You can't get a still shot of somebody giving birth. I mean, they don't stop and you can't call a time out and say pose like that so I can get a picture and put it in the baby book. No, it, but here we got one because, because it proves that the flood uh, killed and preserved uh, this creature instantly, or at least very rapidly, that she wasn't even, even able to finish giving birth. You know, if you're on, the, you know, you're on a ride, your husband's driving you to the hospital, if the baby's coming out, the baby's coming out. You better make it to the hospital or it's coming out anyway. But in this case, no, they stopped right in the middle of it. Um, again, proof, proof of the flood, proof of the Bible. And local floods, as you can see from that picture, a flood cannot cover mountains unless it's a global flood, because yeah. the water would keep running off. That's another refutation of the flat earth. Where did the water go? They have to invent an uh, uh, ice mountain range that went all the way around the world that's not mentioned in the Bible, and that's what kept all the water in. Well, wait a minute, no, the Bible says that the water was higher than the tallest mountains. So it would have been higher than their magical ice range that they have no evidence for. Uh, so it would still went over the edge if you had a flat earth. 
the, wa the wa waters do not stop at the end of a mountain. It would keep on going and keep on going until the water ca came up and covered everything else. So, so much for the, global, the, the Noah's account being a local flood. Okay, Jesus saith, I am the truth. Well, let's see what else did Jesus say. So far, his record's pretty good. You know? Or maybe I should believe him. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Ooh. Even thus shall it be when the day, when the Son of Man, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Once again, he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and compares it to his, re, to his revelation. Wow. So he's not saying it's a made-up story. It's a myth. And, and, and that's, gonna, that's what I'm all about. I'm about myths and made-up stories. No, because we're going to see again the evidence is true. And uh, in Jude, just to uh, reiterate what Sodom and Gomorrah was all about, because they'll say, oh, they were inhospitable. That was their sin. Um, actually, they were too hospitable. That was their sin. <laughs> Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. All right, the homosexuality is a form of fornication. And going after strange flesh instead of what they're supposed to go after, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It's an illustration of hell. So Sodom and Gomorrah, got, Jesus is not saying this stuff's a bunch of, a bunch of myths right. and a bunch of stories. He's comparing it to hell and himself. Obviously, he's saying this stuff really happened. He really believes it. And sure enough, we see evidence of it in the Middle East and I have a, a, a piece over from, a, from the land of uh, Gomorrah that's it's just ash. And it's, and it's 4,000 years old. And it's still ash. And over in this, this part of the Middle East, 4,000 years later, it's still ash. I went, I went and visited Mount St. Helens in about the year 2000, maybe a couple years after, but around that time. And it erupted in 1980. And it erupted sideways. The first volcano we got to observe that erupted sideways. And the direction it erupted, it destroyed everything and made it look just like this. But by the time I went there, just 20 years later, animals were already back, plants were already growing, trees were just starting to grow. And now it's been another 20 years since then, so now it's back to normal. You got tall trees, you got all the animals, everything's back. You would hardly even recognize that a volcano happened if you didn't know, if you didn't read about it in the paper or see it on TV, and, or if you didn't know what to look for. And that's all grown back in, in, two, in a generation. Whereas Sodom and Gomorrah, 4,000 years later, it's still ash, not a blade of grass growing, telling us what God thought about that sin and how God judges sin. Um, maybe we ought to take that into consideration. And the thing I thought about the other day is, here you got this group of these people, the Sodomites, that's where they get their name from, and they take God's symbol that the judgment is over the rainbow, and they use it to promote the, the most decadent stuff going on in this world today. Yeah. How do they think God is going to take that? The same way he took it the first time. <laughs> so they're, they're in for some trouble. Okay, so again, Jesus, that's what Jesus said, and the evidence shows Jesus is telling the truth. I might have to believe this guy if, I keep, if we go any further. Um, from the beginning of the creation, here's Jesus speaking again. Uh, beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Oh, wow, we can't have that in today's society because there's you know, 157 genders. Uh, God made male and female. That's, come on, uh, what, what, God get with it. There's a whole lot more genders than that. Um, and it gives the genea Jesus genealogy all the way from Adam, ultimately, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So Jesus, did Jesus descend from a myth? Did Adam really exist? The Bible says Jesus came from Adam's lineage. Well, if there wasn't a real Adam, then who did Jesus descend from? A monkey? Yeah. Great, 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 great grandpa, grandpa was, was an ape? And that's the Savior you trust in? Because you believe in evolution? Or theistic evolution? What? Well, anyway, did God make them male and female? I mean, Jesus so far has a pretty good track record. Maybe he's wrong about this. Maybe he doesn't know our modern science. Well, we've checked out mitochondrial Eve, and what we call the mitochondrial Eve, and Y-chromosome Adam. Mitochondria comes from the female, 
the Y chromosome is the male chromosome. In the last 10 or 20 years, our knowledge of, of the human genome has just exploded. We can see things in there that we never knew. We can trace things. And sure enough, we trace the human genome. We trace the mitochondria in humans all over the world. Eskimos, Africans, Asians, Europeans, Indians, you name it, people all over the world. You check anybody's uh, genetics and you will find the genetic markers show every one of us came from one individual woman. One. Yes, her name is Eve yes. and she's mentioned in the Bible. If you open your Bible, read the first two pages, you, you, you got it. <laughs> all right, they found the same thing about, about the male checking the Y chromosome. Every human being on the face of the earth comes from one individual man. Correct. His name's Adam. He's been mentioned in the Bible. We've had the record of it for over 4,000 years, 6,000 years. All right, we know, we know who Adam and Eve are. Uh, they didn't. But the scientific evidence shows we all came from one man and one woman. And that's the only two sexes there are. Anybody else is trying to make something up. So, wow, Jesus got it right again. Maybe, maybe he is the truth. Uh, maybe he did come to bear record of the truth. Because it's sure looking like it. The, evi the evidence has proven, proven him right. Uh, here we've got, now we know we all came from Adam, but, and Adam and Eve had children for their whole lives probably, 900 years. They had all kind of children probably, but only eventually Noah, Noah's line got on the ark. So we've got all these uh, different people and the genetics and all that that were just erased from, from humanity because only Noah's family got on the ark. So there's a bottleneck if you're doing the genealogies to where you got all these people and all these people, but it all funnels down into one, into Noah. Yep. So only the genetics that Noah had are what have been carried on to us. I wonder what humanity would be like if we still had our full genetic ability that God created us with. Uh, it'd be interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's why, you know, God, God's, the, fl the flood, people think, oh, God, what a hideous God that he would flood, flood the whole earth. No, the flood was an act of mercy. Because can you imagine what this world would be like if God let all that, all that sin fester? I mean, what's it getting to now? The Bible said in those days that every thought of man was only continually evil. We're not there yet. This, we're getting a lot closer than, I, than I, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, I thought we could ever get. But chances are still, if your car broke down, chances are still probably better that somebody would help you than somebody would hurt you. On the side, you know, if you got stranded on the side of the road, somebody would probably stop and help. Or at least you could call the police or something. In those days, no. Every thought was continually evil. No wonder God uh, wiped them out. It was to give us a second chance, to give us a, 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 a fresh start. Because if we'd have had all that going on, imagine how, how bad would this world be now? But anyway, Nathaniel Jeanson, Dr. Jeanson has done some studies of the genetics and he's starting in the Middle East where obviously humanity kind of sprung from. And so he's using the Bible assumptions instead of the out of Africa theory and all this evolutionary nonsense. Sure enough, he's finding out that all different kind of humans from all different places trace down to three nodes. They all come from three different people, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Exactly. And the one that looks, I asked him about this one that's separated a little bit. I said, is, you know, is that a fourth node? He says, no, that's actually part of the third node, but we were not able to test those people. Uh, so, we don't, so I didn't want to make it look like we had evidence we didn't have yet. He says, but when we do, they're going to fall right in there and that's, that, that'll be filled in because everything else is filling in exactly what we would, would, would expect. So it's three nodes, Noah's three sons. Apparently, apparently this Jesus guy is telling the truth a lot because the science keeps confirming him. This, I mean, the high-tech science, the best stuff. Jesus saith, I am the truth. Okay, I'm starting to believe that. For as Jonas was, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jonah, uh-oh, uh-oh, this can't be right. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Oh, that's a tough one to believe. 
not only that, I mean, Luke 2.34 says, A sign which shall be spoken against. Probably nothing in the Bible has been spoken against more than Jonah and the whale. Because, I mean, that don't happen every day. We don't see scientific examples of whales swallowing people. But, but it happened here, or Jesus said it happened here, and the Old Testament says it happened. Um, and not only that, he compares it. Three days and three nights in, in the whale is compared to three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the gospel. That's how we're saved. Is he's comparing Jonah and the whale to the, God, the saving gospel? Is he saying, well, sees Jonah and the whale, it's a make-believe story. It's just a bunch of myths and silly stuff uh, for kids, you know. It's not real. And that's like the gospel. What? <laughs> All right. No, I, I think he's saying it really happened. Amen. And as at, that happened, that's how the gospel's going to happen. Right. And he did it exactly like he said he would. Now I say, do. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we don't. We I mean, we don't have a video of Jonah actually being swallowed by a whale, but we do have historical records of it. Uh, the letters of Ashurbanipal, which are in the library of <coughs> Nineveh, <laughs> strange place, and. Uh, they date back to the 7th century B.C., which was the time uh, Jonah and the whale would have happened. The letters of Ashurbanipal give the account that matches the book of Jonah, it, that the king was fasting and the people were worried because he was fasting. What's going on? There's a problem here. You know, he, tell us what's going on. He consulted with, with his advisors. The King James Bible calls them his nobles. Same people. He consulted with them. That's in both the Bible and in the letters of Ash, Ashurbanipal. They wore the clothes of a nurse and sat in a reed hut, which coincides that they sat in sackcloth and ashes. Um, an eclipse happened too. That maybe is irrelevant or maybe not. Eclipses tend to happen at important times in the Bible. There's probably because probably God's in control of that stuff. There is evidence for, for Jonah and the whale, uh, Dagon the fish god. Where would they come up with a fish god from? It, was, it had something to do with that. In 3 BC, a, a Babylonian priest, uh, Barosus, wrote of Joannes emerging from the sea. Hmm, interesting. Jo there's Jonah's tomb exists in the Middle East. Uh, just a few years ago, well, 2014, they had it on TV that ISIS invaded and was trying to destroy it. I don't know if they were able to or not, uh, but so Jonah, his, his actual tomb still exists to this day. And Josephus, uh, he attested to Jonah in, in his writings. So we've got a lot of historical evidence that Jonah actually happened just as the little four-chapter book of Jonah in the Bible says so. Wow, even Jonah and the whale, Jesus is telling the truth? Well, when Jesus says, I am the truth, uh, okay, uh, I believe him now. Jesus answering them said, have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was in hunger uh, and they which were with him? Just, this is basically to show that Jesus believed in David and believed in literal events of his life. He didn't specifically mention David and Goliath but he does mention David in, in specific events in David's life. So he did believe in da David was a real person and uh, a real king and did some real things. And uh, of course, we've we mentioned this earlier this week that the, the first evidence we ever found of the kingdoms of Israel was this Tel Dan stell, also called the Hazael Victory Stell, because Hazael was the bad guy, but he won the war, so he named it the Victory Stell. And it mentions eight biblical kings, including four from Israel, including David, and it calls it the House of David. That's the, they weren't discovered till the mid-1990s, 1993. So before 1993, we had to believe David and Solomon and the kingdoms of Israel purely because the Bible said so. Now that's a good basis to put your belief in because the Bible is confirmed so many other ways that you can say, well, I'll just take, I'll just take your word for it, Lord. I mean, you're right about everything else. We don't have evidence for this, but I'll believe it because you've got a good track record of being, of being the truth over and over and over and over again, so I'll trust you for this one. But now we've got evidence. And this evidence caused them to re, uh, reconsider previous evidence they, that they had discovered, and they realized they had more than they thought. And sure enough, yes, the kingdoms of Israel did exist when the Bible says they did, and they had a king named David, and they had all the other kings. And they had to admit, yeah, okay, the Bible was right again. We had, we had, you know, they, 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 they don't like to admit that, but sometimes they have to. Okay, let's see again. We're going to keep on looking and see. Maybe, it seems every time so far, Jesus is telling the truth. Uh, maybe we should believe what he believed. 
Jesus saith, I am the truth. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up, raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in the building. They're thinking it's a, you know, a literal building. He's talking about the temple of his body, which is what it says. Thou wilt rear it up in three days, but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. You know, they didn't believe it before it happened. Yep. So, I mean, the resurrection is kind of important in our salvation. It's, it's like the number one thing to, you know, it forces you to believe in all the rest of the gospel. If you believe in the resurrection, that he rose from the dead, that means you have to believe he was dead, and you have to believe he was alive, and the time in the tomb confirms that he was dead and rose again from the dead. So if you believe in the resurrection, that pretty much covers everything. And... He's talking about, and the apostles themselves did not believe in the resurrection until after it happened. Hmm, that's interesting. There maybe there's some doctrinal differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, we don't want to, you know, spend a lot of time, but there, obviously things are not the same. Amen. And sure enough, there is evidence, again, historical evidence. We don't have a, a videotape of the resurrection, and resurrections do not happen in the scientific labs, but we have historical evidence, the Nazareth inscription, I have a replica of that, that they had a problem. There was an empty tomb in the Middle East, in Israel. Because they didn't have that problem in the rest of the Roman Empire because they, they, they incinerated their, their dead. They didn't bury them. Israel, the Jews buried their dead. So they had this problem. There's this empty tomb that we know we put somebody in there, you know, over the weekend, and he's gone. And we, we, we sealed the tomb, and we had four squads of soldiers guarding it, so nobody could get him in, nobody could, nobody could... And we opened the tomb, and he's gone. How did that happen? And now these people are worshiping this guy because he said he was going to rise from the dead, and now his tomb's empty. They're supposed to worship Caesar. So they went to Caesar to tell him about this problem that they had in Israel. Now, Caesar is ruling basically the civilized world. Why would he care about some little empty tomb in Israel? If you had a, an issue like that, you would not go to the President of the United States. You would call your local police, deal with it in your local courts, or your, your city government, or, or county government, or maybe state government. They went straight to Caesar and says, we've got this empty tomb, we need you to do something about it. He wrote a law that dates to within a few years of the resurrection that anybody found stealing a body from a grave should be put to death because they didn't want that to happen again. And it only applied in Israel because they didn't, it, it, there was no cause for it the rest of the Roman Empire because, you know, they, they incinerated their dead. And so it specifically dealt with body. Now, who would steal a body from a grave anyway? You might steal jewelry or valuables or money or whatever they were buried with, but you're not going to steal a body. Yeah, yeah, you put the body in the back room, in a couple days you won't want it there anymore. A few hours. And, uh, yeah, a few hours maybe. So the resurrection made a stir across the entire Roman Empire. Yes, it did. And it affected to the point where Caesar passed a law pertaining to the resurrection. That's how much of a, an effect it had. The Bible rules the world. And that grave is still empty today. Amen because he's not there. Amen. He Praise rose the from the forever. dead. Amen. Now, Jesus saith, I am the truth. Okay, okay, I'll concede. Yes, you're the truth, Jesus. Every time you open your mouth, you're telling the truth. Sometimes I don't like that because it says bad things about me, but it's, it's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Jesus answering and said, a certain man went down to Jeru from Jerusalem to Jericho. So just a, a, a mention that Jesus believed in Jericho. Obviously, Jericho was a real city. He believed in Jericho. Uh, uh, Hebrews uh, 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. So we have discovered the walls of Jericho. Yep. Can you believe it? This Jesus is right again. And not only did he discover the walls of Jericho, it confirms every minor detail in the account. And years ago they had discovered uh, parts of, of Jericho and parts of Ai, and notice it didn't match the Bible account. Turned out they had, they had found a different Ai, 
uh, back in the early parts of the 20th century. And Dr. Wood, uh, in the last couple of decades, has done some excavating, and they found a different AI, which is no big deal. There are different cities of the same name all over the place. There are different Jeffersons and Washingtons and Lincolns in every state. Um, so the fact that there were two cities named AI, there were two cities named Antioch in the Book of Acts. So there, two cities named AI is, is not a stretch at all. And now that they found the other AI, everything matches up with the biblical account to the finest detail. It proves the because the scoffers did not want to believe that Israel was a nation, was a world power at that point. They were just some little neighborhood that nobody cared about. But it turns out these things prove the city was occupied when the Bible says it was occupied. It was fortified when the Bible says it was fortified. It was in the correct area, the correct date, the correct time. They found pottery and scarabs that would have matched up with what they would have expected to find at that time. They found a plaque with the sitting pharaoh's name on it. Like they had a, a, a plaque on the wall, you know, worshiping their pharaoh or whatever of the guy that was Pharaoh at that time. It'd be like digging up somebody's house from the 1860s and finding a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. All right, well, they found a, a plaque of the Pharaoh. They found the North Gate. They found that the walls indeed fell outward, just like the Bible says, which doesn't make any sense because if you're attacking a city, you're not going to knock the walls down on top of yourself. Amen. You're going to knock the walls down on top of them. Or you're going to hurdle the walls or, or something. You're not going to knock... But that's, see, they didn't attack the city. They marched around the city and played hail to the victors. And, uh, and of course, the walls went, went flat. Now, you guys would think he picked another song but hail to the victors, but I'm from Michigan, so that's, that's also going to be the, the trumpet song at the rapture. Yeah. Where all these people from Ohio, they're going to have to go to heaven with hail to the victors in their ears, but they'll be happy about it. <laughs> and what... It also, okay, so it proves the Bibles f fell outward, just like the Bible. This is proving a Bible miracle. This isn't just proving that a city existed. This is proving that there's something the Bible mentioned that was an absolute miracle. Marching band, marching around the city, blows their trumpets, the walls fall down outward. It really happened. Amen. And the Bible, it casually mentions in the account that it was harvest time. That seems like such an insignificant detail. Who cares? Why would it matter? But they found dozens of, of jars of grain. So even that detail is correct. <coughs> God told them once the walls fell down, march, out, you know, march right up the ramp they just made for you and burn the city. Burn it all. Destroy it. And of course, the remains of Jericho that they found from back then were all burned. Except there was one house one dwelling that wasn't burned. And the Bible talks about Rahab the harlot taking in the spies, being good to the children of Israel. And they said, you put a scarlet thread in your window and you can have your family or whoever you can have in your house, we will pass by your house and we won't burn it. We'll burn the whole rest of the city down and we'll leave your house alone. And in the rubble of Jericho, they found one dwelling that wasn't burned down. Now, you explain that, evolutionist, Amen. by chance. Amen. You, by, Bible denier, Bible, Bible scoffer. How, how does that happen? Amen. Can you find that in the Koran? No. You, you can spend your whole life looking. So, uh, a few more. We looked at these the other day, so I just kind of passed by them briefly. But uh, the Pool of Bethesda, the city of Tregillium is uh, one we didn't mention, and Diana of the Ephesians, uh, all being confirmed historically that they weren't confirmed historically until modern, the modern era, the 19, 1960 or so. But the city of Tregillium, uh, I, I can't find it in any other Bible but one. And it's just a list of cities that Paul went to. You know, not, not a big deal, but it mentions Tregillium in one certain Bible. Yeah. It doesn't mention it in any other Bible I looked at. There may be, maybe somewhere it does, but I've, I looked up like 30 different Bible versions and it was not mentioned in any of them because they didn't have any evidence of it. Well, you do now. There's, there's the modern Tregillium built on the old Tregillium that they discovered in around 1960. So it was a real city. Paul really went to it and really mentioned it in the Bible. But because we didn't have archaeological evidence for it, uh, the, the modern versions said, well, we better not include this because we don't think there's no such place. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. The Bible was right all along. 
and uh, Jesus saith, I am the truth, so if it's in his word, I'm going to believe it. And again, the King James Bible, the uh, Texas Receptus, they knew what happened in Jerusalem before it was destroyed in 70 AD. And that's how they translated it. The modern versions says, well, we don't have any evidence for these things. They must be a mistake, so we're going to leave it out. So Jesus saith, I am the truth. Okay, I'm convinced at this point, as many things as I've just seen, it convinces me. He's, he's the truth. And when he speaks, he, when he bears record, it's of the truth. Uh, and he says, now, if I've told you earthly things, and that's all this stuff we're looking at, all the stuff we've looked at in the message, uh, if I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? I mean, heaven, hell, the rapture, the second coming, uh, miracles, prophecy. How are we going to believe that stuff if we can't believe the simple stuff he tells us about, about the things we just looked at? And he, Jesus also said, this is, and everything we've looked at today is what Jesus said. So if you have a problem with any of it, your argument is not with me. Your argument's with Jesus. He said it. He said this. He said, had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Now he's posing the question, and that's something to think about. How, could you, how can you believe part of the Bible but not, not the rest of it? You know, it could, it could all, might, all, might all be wrong then. And I think we're seeing evidence just the other way around. It's all right. Uh, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of you will give account of yourself, one-on-one, -on -one, you and God. Nobody will be there to answer for you. Nobody will be there to help you. You won't be able to say, but so-and-so told me this, and, and I, I thought that this is, no, it's going to be you and God. You better get things straight between you and God now because you're going, you're going to then, whether you like it or not. But God gives us the solution for God so loved the world, and, you know, we're all sinners. We're all going, uh, uh, you know, people say, a good, loving God would never send anybody to hell. How come they never say a good, loving judge would never send a prisoner to prison? Because we expect justice, and a, a good judge would send people to prison. He, a good judge would even have people executed. Yeah. So a good, loving God would send people to hell. Because heaven cannot be defiled, cannot be corrupted. And if he just sent unrepentant sinners to heaven, in short time it would be just what we have now on earth. And we'd have, they'd have to have multiple bathrooms in heaven because nobody would know which one to use. So, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, we're all sinners, but he gave us the solution. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You don't have to have death. The wages of sin is death. And we're all sinners. But Jesus wasn't. That's what dying on the cross was all about. He took care of our sin. He bore our sin. He became our sin and paid for our sin that we don't have to. That we can trust in Him, believeth in Him, and He took care of our sin. So we will go to heaven as if we're sinless, Amen. spotless, perfect. Amen. You know, we will all be in heaven with our glorified bodies. We will be perfect, spotless, sinless. There'll be one guy in heaven who's got marks on his hands and his side and his feet. One imperfect person in all of heaven will be Jesus Christ, showing I took this for you. Amen. We will be perfect. He'll have scars. Amen. Wow, that's, that's, that's mind-boggling. So the wages of sin is death, Sp physical death when they bury you in the ground, spiritual death when you, when you, when you go to hell, lake of fire, and, and, and torment forever. I don't want either of those kind. I can't avoid one of the deaths. I'm going to die unless, unless the rapture happens before, before lunchtime, but, which would be okay. Um, I still might die. I'm getting old. <laughs> but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So he offers us a free gift. It's a gift.
That means you can't earn it. You can't be good enough to get it. You can't be righteous enough. The Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in His sight. And you think you're going to impress God? That Look how good I am, God. I repented more than this next guy. God don't care. It's filthy rags that you're putting in His face and saying, Here, see my filthy rags? No, God says, I did it all. Trust me. Not of yourself, not of your works. <laughs> it's the gift of God, lest any should boast. He, it's all through faith, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the church can't do it. The Pope can't do it. The pastor can't do it. Mary can't do it. The saints can't do it. Being good can't do it. Sacraments can't do it. Baptism can't. On and on. Whatever else you want to name, uh, if, you, if you substitute anything for Jesus, you fall short. Yeah. It's, it's all Jesus. He died. He, he paid the price. Yeah. Mary didn't die on the cross. None of the saints died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Amen. So put your trust in him. Amen. And let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all these things you've given us. Uh, boy, it's becoming apparent to me that Jesus is the truth. And he spoke the truth and he told the truth even about these things. Creation and the flood and David and Goliath and Jonah and the whale. Uh, unbelievable. And, and, and all these things we've looked at, it turns out the evidence shows Jesus spoke the truth. Amen. We thank you that we can trust every word that Jesus ever spoke and every word in the, in the Bible that, that he authored and inspired for us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know what it comes down to every single time is, is there a God? If there's a God, what did he say? Right? If there's a God, what did he say? Is there a God or did he just leave man in, if there's a God, did he say anything? Or is he just leaving man in the dark, letting man just figure things out? No, I believe there's a God and I believe he said something. And the best way to communicate something and keep it preserved from generation to generation is in a book. It's not in the minds of men. You know how that thing works. You tell one person one thing, and before you know it, the whole thing's just misconstrued and yeah. doesn't, doesn't sound anything like the, the, uh, the original thing that was told. But God kept his word and preserved it in a book. And I thank God we have that book. And it's truth. You know, there's only two truths in the Bible. Jesus, that's what he said, I'm truth. Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? Well, let me tell you, Pontius Pilate, uh, the, the man that's standing right in front of you is truth. Amen. There's two things in the Bible that are true, and that's Jesus and that's the Scriptures. They both claim to be truth. Truth is absolute. Is truth absolute? Amen. Truth is truth. There's no such thing, I don't care what the scientists, philosophers, they come up with all this nonsense and junk. Truth is relative. Like my truth is not your truth and your truth isn't their truth. Everyone has their own truth. Does that sound kind of confusing? No, truth is absolute. It's not relative. Truth is true. And Jesus, who was the Word, and the Scripture are the only two things in that Bible that claim to be true. Jesus and His Word. And they're both absolutes. You know what's absolutely true? It's appointed unto men once to die. Amen. Matthew was holding that scripture out on the, on the street corner the other day, yesterday. And, he, and he's, it's kind of like dawning on him. Like, how can you deny this? It's appointed unto men once to die. How can you deny this? Those three teenagers I witnessed to, I had the same sign that he had. I said, I said is that true? Of course it's true. You ever been to a funeral? It bears witness, does it not? Yeah. The point of a man wants to die, and after this, the what? Judgment. That's just as true. That's just as true. That every human being, every person will stand before the truth. Yeah. You don't think he's going to find out your little secrets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows everything that's going on. 
But what you have there and all this historical stuff and what you're getting is just, I mean, if you were with the archaeologists when they found that, you'd see it just like they saw it. And they saw it and they wrote about it and they bear record. And it just backs up one book, doesn't it? Why is it all these, these findings, they just back up one book? Over and over and over again. Uh, you started out with that, was that in Sunday school where you started out with the, the kids all, the, all six days a week getting bombarded? Was that? Sunday morning, yeah. Kids getting bombarded. And then, you know, an hour in church. They wonder why they don't pay attention. You know what the kids need on Monday? Bible. You know what the kids need on Tuesday? Bible. You know what the kids need on Wednesday? Bible. You encourage your children to get in the Bible. Most mornings I'll find Matthew before he does anything. He'll be in his, in his bed getting some Bible, reading some Bible. Say, why? Because I force him? I have forced him from time to time. I just does it on his own. Getting some Bible. And I pray Matthew turns out. Amen. Pray for your kids. They're getting bombarded 24-7. And they got a phone and got all that stuff and just getting bombarded with junk. That's what pastors have to deal with nowadays. It's a challenge. It's a challenge for me, knowing that kids and even adults, all of us, all week long are just getting hammered with the world, the world, the world, anti-Bible, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-Christ. And then they come into church like this. I got no entertainment here. <laughs> I've got no bells and whistles. And expect people to be in tune and listen. I know who's listening, amen. I know who's getting it. For the most part, it's those that are in their Bible throughout the week. Listen to some preaching throughout the week. My wife does her packaging every morning. She packages up our stuff for our business and uh, most of the time she's listening to Gene Kim or David Peacock and, or she'll be listening yeah. to the Bible. Yeah. Why is that? It's food. Yeah. Amen. 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 You getting fed or is it just an hour on Sunday where you tune the preacher out, right? And you're not getting anything except the world's food. Junk food, junk food, junk food 24-7. Yeah, I don't know how you expect to be healthy. You're getting some stuff here that can help you, amen. amen. You listen, pay attention to the truth. Truth is not relative, people. It is absolute. It's absolute. It's undeniable. Truth is truth. Whether you believe the Bible is true or not, that's between you and God. But what Jesus said was true, it can be proven. It can be proven. And that's what the brothers tried to do. So, amen for that. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Certainly appreciate that. Well, let's get some food. we got some pizza back there for the kids. How about that? Does that sound good, Kevin? Yeah. Thumbs up, man. <laughs> you know, all I want for you people is to, is to succeed brings joy to my soul for you to succeed spiritually. I'm not worried so much about you succeeding in this world, although you ought to have a job and pay your bills. But my desire, like God's desire for His children, is to walk in truth. You have truth and error. You walk in error, you're going to find yourself in a ditch. You're going to find yourself in a hole. And then you're going to desire some good brothers and sisters in Christ to help you out. Amen, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Let's pray for this food. Uh, thank you all for that, that sacrificed and brought food. And then after we're done eating, we'll have another. Brother's going to give us another service, and that'll be it. That'll be it. And I hope you take something with you from this. That's why we have these uh, evangelists in. They get a different viewpoint. A different ministry. He's more focused on this one thing, this one area of expertise. Uh, the pastor can't always just be focused on one thing. It has to be multiple things. And that's why we have men and Brother Spurgeon will be with us at the end of July. So please keep that in your prayers. He's got a different perspective, doesn't he? Someone from a criminal biker gang for many years, saved, preaching the gospel. What a testimony. 
Very much looking forward to that. All right, Father God, thank you, Lord, for the message this morning. Thank you for truth. Lord, with all the errors in this world and with all the deception, with all the half-truths and twisted truths, and Lord, I thank you that I have the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I can put my hand on that Bible and believe it from cover to cover and even believe the cover. It's a holy book. It's the only holy book on planet Earth. It's the only holy book in the world. It's the only holy book that we can read and believe and trust. And I thank you for it. Thank you for that spiritual food. And we should be feeding ourselves daily that we can be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. And we do thank you also for our earthly food uh, that you've given us to take care of our bodies. Help us to help us to take care of our bodies, Lord, this temple of the living God, uh, all things in moderation. Uh, keep a good testimony before this world. And we do thank you for this food. Bless it to our body. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.